camera. Um, so, thanks for inviting me and asking me to speak. Um, I guess other than Alec, who has seen me talk before, um, no one else really knew what they were in for. Um, so pretty much today is me talking about a little bit about the history of R, uh, and the history of R from the point of view that I studied at the University of Auckland and worked at the University of Auckland, which is where I was born. So I'm going to start off, um, I know that you've all had your first drink, so I'm going to start off talking about me, which will drive you to your second drink. Uh, by that stage, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the history of R, um, a little bit about awards that it's won, and by that stage, you should be up to your third drink, and so I have some tips and tricks, but by that stage, you're not going to remember. Um, so there's only a couple of them. But you'll share the slides. I will share the slides. I was just thinking of the important thing that I had to say before I started. Uh, one of the nice things with Prezi, it's an online format. Uh, these slides are publicly available. Um, the URL will go up on the Meetup website. So you can go and recreate the talk if you would like. <coughs> Conspire against me, which is really quite sad. Because I even practiced before we started. Okay. Oh. I decided to make a bit silly. Which is really quite unfortunate. So, a little bit about me. I am at Swanbourne University now. I've only been in Australia since April. Um, you can probably tell from my Kiwi accent. My students seem to love. I was going to say mocking it, they don't know that I, that I know that they mock it because they think that they do it privately on Facebook, but they actually do it quite publicly on Facebook. <laughs> so they, uh, they're busy compiling the Kiwi to Australian Dictionary, um, so I can probably link you to that as well, anything that I say that you don't understand. Um, prior to that, I taught at a place called Unitech, which is in Auckland, but I did my PhD, did a lot of summer scholarship, uh, a lot of sessional type work through the University of Auckland. So I started studying in the University of Auckland in 1997. Uh, a little bit later when we get onto history, you'll see it's actually quite a key date. So I think I was quite lucky with when I started there with regards to R and learning about R. I studied finance and I started off studying computer science and I realised that I hated it and so I started studying stats. And little did I know that actually I did like computing, but I just didn't like computer science lecturers. Uh, all those particular ones that I had. Uh, the stats ones, on the other hand, were actually really teaching the same stuff, uh, but they called it stats instead of programming, and I quite liked that. So I did honours and I did masters in stats. Uh, I went away and started lecturing came back to do my PhD, I had a number of summer scholarships where I was writing R for academics. Um, today I went on to Cran to actually look and see whether I am credited with any of the work that I did. Uh, of the packages that I worked on, I have discovered that I am the uncredited author. Um, so it's kind of like one of those movie bit roles where you just Obviously, it was so insignificant, they just left your name out altogether. Um, so I've written bits of packages. I haven't had my own package, which has my name on it. Um, on there, more recently with the artwork that I've done, it's been very much for kind of analysis, uh, a little bit of simulation, things that I've been trying to achieve, and I haven't really had the, the time or the patience to turn it into a package. And as of yet, I haven't had my own kind of some scholarship research assistant slaves to <laughs> do what I was doing for other academics when I was at Auckland. So I guess I can kind of live in hope that maybe one day I'll have my own masters and PhD slaves that can go and turn my arco and the things that I have done into, um, into packages that can go up on cram and other people can use them. <coughs> A little bit more easily than if they just received my code at the moment. Um, I looked at a couple of the packages I went through and kind of recognised some of the slightly marginally shoddy programming 
So it's, um, it's still there, just as other people's names. <coughs> Okay, it's behaving itself now. So, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the history of R. Um, some of you probably know some of this. Uh, you possibly won't all or care, necessarily care about all of it. Um, so, R was written by these two guys, Ross and Robert. Um, so here's Ross. This is Ross's current staff page at the University of Auckland. He is still at the University of Auckland. Um, I can assure you that when I met him in 1997, he looked older than that. Um, I believe the photo was at least five years old at the time and has been updated like all good academic websites. Uh, so he now an associate professor there at Auckland. He's been there for quite some time. Uh, this is probably a little bit small for you to see. Um, just at the bottom here, you've got a couple of his publications. And so the key one, 1996, uh, a language for data, R, a language for data analysis and graphics. So that was really where he started telling people about R. It wasn't when he started making R, but it was when he started telling people about R. And at that stage when he was publishing, he hadn't quite let all that many other people play with R yet, but that was one of the key moments. Okay, this is going to be really unfortunate this morning. There's Robert. Um, Robert had really moved on from the University of Auckland by the time I was at the stage of doing postgrad and getting to know the staff and work with and that kind of thing. Uh, he's now at Genentech. Uh, the blurb there is much too small for you to read, but he still uses R regularly, writes packages, uses it as his main analysis tool. So he's still kept in contact with the community, but not to the same extent as Ross, who uh, is still plugging away with uh, R-related things. I forgot to give my little lecturer's talk, making sure you find it. So, 1993 was actually when it all started, and this picture is because Ross um, has this great analogy of a broken down car. So, he was getting interviewed and he was being asked about R, and he said, well, we started writing R, and it was kind of like this car that we got from the records, and it didn't work, and it was really useless, and it was awful, it was broken down, and we got our car, and we put it on the side of the road. And we stood next to it, looking really sorry for ourselves, and waiting for people to come along who had more expertise and parts and better ideas, and they helped us to turn this car into something that was actually quite good. So the broken down car was always Ross's analogy of R. Um, and even if you talk to him today about R and his feelings about R, and I'm going to mention a bit about that later on, um, he still kind of talks about it in the sense of it being this kind of broken down car and certainly the fact that the not only this meetup group but there are so many people that are actively using R and encouraging others to use R as their main analysis tool uh, I think or well, hopefully we'd all agree that it's not a broken down car anymore um, as with any software it's not without its flaws uh, but on the whole it's generally a pretty good software tool to be using. But if you ask Ross, that's how he kind of describes the development. 1993, they had a broken down car and they went looking for how. So again, I apologise for this being so small, even though we were going to have quite such a small screen. So 1993, they started working on it. 96, they published that article. 97 is where we started to have these key events. Um, you can actually still get source code. That was the end of the alpha versions of R. Um, hopefully it all worked out that R is R because of Ross and Robert. Uh, and also because it was very much copying the S language. Uh, so 1997, that was when I started university. And that was where they got to the point of finishing off the alpha releases. Uh, by the end of 1997, it was part of the new project. They were getting it across Unix, across 
Mac and across PC, and they were starting to roll it out into the university courses at the University of Auckland as well. And it really, it didn't take long for it to spread across to a lot of other universities. Um, but there, I guess, those of us that um, in the late 90s were at the University of Auckland, we were kind of the guinea pigs, I think. Um, I look back at some of my old, my very, very early course notes with uh, R material in it. And certainly there's functions, and there's a few things that have disappeared and look quite different from what they do now. It's been quite a long time since there's been any structural changes like that. Um, it was 2000 when the developers decided that it was stable enough for any kind of production use. So they weren't happy until 2000. I don't know if there's really any big major other dates in there. Um, the parallel package coming out this year I think has been quite helpful as well. Parallel computing is certainly um, one of the key growth areas for high-end, not only just statistical but really kind of computer and simulation applications. So being able to run R on clusters, on grids, being able to do parallel processing, um, <coughs> threading and th things that otherwise you would have had to resort to Java and other languages to do, being able to do that in R is uh, really good. Haven't done it with R yet. Um, my PhD in part did use grid computing but using Java, so it is something I'm quite interested in. And, um, if there is anyone that has done any grid computing, uh, I would be interested in hearing about it. So something I also <coughs> wanted to talk about was the popularity of R. So how many people are using it? And Turns out that that is a really hard question to try and answer. One site that I found, and again, the URL being so small, but um, Google Sites, R for statistics slash popularity. Uh, there's a whole lot of different metrics and graphs there. Trying to really get a handle on comparing R with SAS, SPSS, R. Um, up there you've got S plus down the bottom. Um, I grabbed this one in part because it was one of the clearer graphs for just putting up as a presentation. So this is this is traffic, um, email discussion traffic. So it's not necessarily indicating how many people are using it. It could be, could be just how many questions. There could be more R users that have a, uh, a lot of questions and get stuck more easily. Um, Having said that, though, maybe you would expect SAS to be a bit higher because it can be pretty miserable to use. Um, so we can see that there's been a really big growth in, um, in traffic for R. Again, you can question quite how reliable their measurement was of this, but I think this was one of the areas where they actually could just kind of web troll, they could use some data in terms of popularity um, and usage. Beyond that, it's quite a tricky thing to do. Um, you could look at, for instance, number of downloads of R and R packages, um, but then you don't really have any kind of comparison because you're not going to know how many people have been sucked into buying SPSS or are stuck with SAS at work or uh, are using something else. <coughs> so it's something that is really pretty hard to try and get a gauge of. Um, certainly amongst academics, R is very popular because it's free, it's a very large community, it's, a lot, it's very easy to get help, there's some really great packages. Uh, pretty much now, anything you can imagine that you might want to try and analyse, there's going to be packages that someone has written sitting there for you to be able to download. Um, really the only stumbling block that I find in academia with R is Introducing new users, and particularly looking at it from the point of view as something you would teach students, um, the command line interface can be a bit tricky for someone if they're not au okay with that. And I think particularly as cohorts of students are coming through now where they don't know what DOS is, they've never had to type a command line. They, if you can't point and click at it or touch it on a touch screen, then it's just too hard. Um, so this is quite tricky when you're dealing with undergrads and thinking about whether R would be appropriate to try and teach them. Because you really want them to use it because it's really good and helpful and useful and easy and free. And I have students who are using SPSS and it's not free and 
It is point and click, which is very easy, but it just is really awful and painful to try and get them to do some things with it. Um, so it's a little bit problematic. There is R Commander, and there are graphical interfaces that you can put here at the top of, um, of R to try and make it a little bit point and click. This is a little bit kind of fumbly at the moment. Maybe that is something for the future. Um, in terms of measuring how much of the Jews in industry, that's quite hard to gauge. Um, I tried having a look on the SEEK website for jobs where they might be interested in R. But unfortunately, if you search for the letter R, um, <laughs> you get all sorts of interesting job. Um, stripper, as an R, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, wasn't quite what I was looking for. Um, I found if I searched for SAS and SQL and other related terms, sometimes it would say statistical software, SAS, R, SQL, something, something, something. Um, but searching for R by itself, again, not, not really a very uh, useful way of trying to work out how popular it is. Okay, so R has won a number of awards, as have Robert and Ross. Um, I didn't really want to get into a lot of detail about the awards. Um, now Prezi's going to try and make it look silly again. Last year, Ross got a Lifetime Achievement Award for Open Source Software in New Zealand. Uh, previously, he's also won the Pickering Medal, which is the <coughs> top uh, government award for science. So those two of the most notable awards that Ross has won. Uh, Robert has won Benjamin Franklin Award in 2008 in America as well. Um, so those are three of the mo more notable awards that um, those two have received. There's been a lot of smaller ones as well, but I thought those three were worth mentioning. Probably of even more note though, because I've got a lot of uh, secondary press coverage and from what I've heard, really increased uh, number of downloads of our interest in our, in our website was a New York Times article a couple of years ago. Um, so 2009, again, URL is probably a little bit small for you to be able to see, but you can jump online and link to this. Um, the New York Times had an article about R, about statistical software with a focus on R because of this free um, interviewed Ross. There's Ross and Robert. Ross looking more like he does now rather than his uh, university profile photo. Um, and that actually got a lot of then secondary coverage in other newspapers and uh, particularly New Zealand, of course, because as the New Zealander in the New York Times, I think that made front page of uh, <laughs> front page of the New Zealand papers that uh, it's a New Zealander, it's a New York Times, and it's not even a sports guy, it's not an all black or anything. Um, so that that was really, from what I've heard, uh, had quite a big impact, just because. I don't want to say up until that point it was kind of a, a closed community, but certainly outside of academia, if you hadn't come across R um, through university or because you perhaps had a colleague who, again, probably through the prompting of a uh, overzealous academic at university, you probably wouldn't have come across the software. But here it was in a major publication with them really gushing over it, really talking about how good it was, and you could do, use it for data mining, and you could use it for this, and you could use it for something else. And, it's free and it's amazing and it's free. Um, so that was really pretty great coverage for it. So I think it was the first time I came to an R meet up here, but there's been a number of times that I've been asked questions from people when they found out that I was from the University of Auckland and had worked with Ross. Um, about some statements that Ross has made online, uh, you probably can't see the blurb there, um, 
but the title, Ross Ehak to R, Drop Dead, um, is maybe pretty concerning. Yeah, if, if you love R and you love the software, and here's the creator of the software saying these really quite awful things, um, both on online and in person at, at a couple of um, international stats conferences, there's, there's been comments kind of along these lines. And I kind of get asked for my opinion on it, and I don't really want to try and take his words and, and kind of extract meaning. Um, really, kind of my feeling is that this was his baby, and he can see all the flaws because he's grown it from nothing. So he knows, really inside out, all of the flaws and all of the problems and all of the issues with kind of memory management and things that you probably weren't thinking about in 1993 that are now relevant today, um, particularly memory and big data sets and the way that they handle is looping and things like that. Um, so in his mind, here's all these problems and he wishes he could just start from scratch and have something that didn't have those problems. Um, of course, R's got thousands and thousands of users now. So I, it, it's not just going to kind of disappear. Whether one day in the future we do see a new software, and I would happily listen to any suggestions of what letter of the alphabet we would uh, like to choose for it, um, that will maybe take the R shell, the, the command line, fix up some of those little problems, I don't know. Um, Given my background, I did want to mention it. I didn't really want to talk about it any further than that, though, because I don't know just the idea of R dropping dead is maybe a little bit sad. Okay, here we go for time. So we should have food arriving in about ten minutes, which hopefully gives us five minutes of tips and tricks and five minutes of questions. Or three minutes of tips and tricks, three minutes of questions, and another beer, perhaps. Um, I didn't really want to put any R code into my talk because even before I knew that it was a teeny tiny screen, it's generally something that's pretty hard to look at on the screen and get any kind of appreciation for. Um, but I did want to try and provide just a couple of ideas and thoughts about if you are an R user, whether you're a new user or an experienced user, things that you could be thinking about to to try and improve your experience and get them all out of the software. Um, so the first one, which is going to be way too small for you to really see anything, um, is to have a good text editor and to save what you do. <laughs> even if it's just, even if you're just doing, you know, if your job is 10 lines of code that achieve something and you think you're never going to see it again, saving it and filing it. So the program that's too small for you to really see, the top half, is a text editor called Tin R, T I double N dash R. It's a text editor that talks to R. When you type R code into Tin R, it will color it to give you functions and show you where your brackets are beginning and ending and all the nice things that a basic text editor doesn't do. It's got, even got send to R buttons. So up here, when I've got some R code, I can send all of my R code or selected bits of my R code through to R to run. So that way, Rather than just typing straight command lines into R, I've got my record of what I've been doing sitting there into R. If I need to come back to it in a week or a month or a year, I know that I've saved my code because I haven't just been typing it straight into R and using it. So Tin R is really effective. The other thing I thought I would point out here, um, you guys in the in front, they definitely can't see, uh, Revolution. Enterprise 4.3. So there's the sponsor. The sponsor plug, since they are giving us free beer, I had 10 hour matched up with Revolution rather uh, than the usual one. Second tip, uh, particularly if you're a newer user, is really to see what other people are doing with that. So there's a website, uh, bloggers, uh, blogger.com, that links to, I forget, 200, 300 odd different blogs of all sorts of different things that somehow relate to them. Some of the bloggers 
show you code and examples, others don't. It's really a case of looking through and seeing which ones of these people in here are doing things that I'm quite interested in, are presenting code, are showing me really useful things. Because there's some really excellent ones in there. So just being able to see what other people are doing, how they're doing it, and especially when there is sample code, so you can see here's, here's the way that other people are programming um, really quite a lot. Once you go beyond that step, the next step beyond kind of how other people code is what are the conventions for actually coding a file with a live package? And that's kind of really quite a big next step because there's specific conventions um, and style for if you do actually want to write a package. Um, for a lot of you, that's, that's probably something you're not going to be as worried about because it is a reasonable amount of additional effort. It does mean that you can have a package sitting there on the and other people are going to be able to access it. It does involve writing all the documentation, all the nice things and having it in structure layer. So, thoroughly recommend uh, our bloggers. I didn't think I would mention any specific blog within it, but just go in there, explore, and um, they're on Facebook as well, so you can have kind of Facebook status things appearing, and then you've got um, different blogs being posted. And the very last tip that I thought I would do, <laughs> um, I've heard that these guys are pretty good. Um, normally when there's talks, there's a bit more R code and substance to them. Um, it's not just some guy talking about going to university and meeting people. Um, but really just interacting with other R users. And I've found that particularly with this group, uh, you've got a decent number of people um, you've got the discussion board there, you've got excellent presentations, and certainly the ones that I've been to, I've learned a lot. Uh, not only about using R, but R applied to all sorts of different areas. Um, those of you, for instance, that were there for Carl's talk a few months ago about the AFL, um, really, really interesting stuff. So even though I don't get to go back to my office and do heat maps of uh, where, where a rival's been uh, running around the field, I can still kind of get an appreciation of all that. Okay, so with only minor hiccups on not being able to zoom properly to my presentation all this evening. Um, I just wanted to ask any questions that you have about, I'm not quite sure which bit, whatever I forgot to mention. <coughs> yeah. How do you file your snippets? What's your what's your what's your method for <laughs> filing all those little snippets of code? How do I or how should I? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I kind of currently I would just kind of I have a folder for the moment I'm working on uh, analysis marriage patterns. So I've got the folder which has got then within it kind of journal articles and, and research and kind of my writings and things like that. So somewhere in there I have a file which is just how I go to that. And that's not necessarily ideal because if there was something I was doing there, if I forgot about it, I'm not going to kind of think, oh, I should go back into, into that area. I guess it depends on whatever works for you. I mean, most people kind of have a way that they, they save stuff. Um, having looked at a couple of colleagues' computers in the last few days, I would say, knock on your desktop. <laughs> um, Beyond that, whatever, whatever works, I guess. Um, you know, if, if you had a folder that you just, you know, you had generic bits of R code, you just had a spot where you kept them all. No, I just did from what you did. I have a question about your graph, your yep. use of downloads and mentions in emails. And yes. R uh, tends to just peak at that I, I don't know if that drop off was a, you know, that only calculated, they only kind of head up to October. They only, I mean, I, I don't know if you were seeing a drop off because it wasn't a full year. It's worrying. It's worrying. <laughs> Maybe everyone's questions have been answered. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think it would have been the activity of the New York Times? Uh, 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 Maybe. The, um, a lot, of, a lot more of those will be kind of how do I do dot, dot, dot. Um, so whether, whether there are seasonal patterns within that and kind of that combined with a haven't gone quite a whole year, you might have missed a period of I don't, from what I recall, I mean, you can go and have a look at the site and see what they've written about the data collection. Um, 
Uh, not a question, but a comment. If you're ever involved in the development of a second, like a follow-up to R, yeah. uh, call it R2. R2. <laughs> but just make sure George Lucas doesn't sue. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. You mentioned when it's read from Auckland, I got the sense that it was fairly rapid. Uh, yeah. What do you think were the factors that caused its, um, the word to spread? Was it, was it sort of publicised or was it mm. free? I think free. I think I think free, <laughs> free was a big one, and I think at the time, I mean, the um, you had for those that were kind of really into that area, you had the journal publication and then conference presentations. So in terms of the academic community, you know, Ross and Robert actually going out and talking about well, here's, here's what we're working on for the last four years. Here's the thing. It's pretty neat. It looks like S plus, which you're used to, but it's free and it's. Um, open source and you, you, can, you can do object oriented stuff and it's, it, it's like the thing you already know but it's better because it's got all these advantages and no real disadvantage to it. So I think really it was just, it, it, filled, it filled that need at that time. Uh, beyond that, uh, could, could you sense, since you were there, could you sense whether it's going to get to be? I suspect as a first year student, um, <laughs> given that I have a whole lot of first year exams sitting in my office, um, that I probably looked at and thought, oh, it's a stupid software we have to learn. Um, so I don't, I don't think kind of as an undergrad I really thought about it that much. Um, and really it was only when I was looking back at some of these dates that I actually kind of dawned on me of how new it was when I started using it. because. They didn't, they didn't mention that when they, they rolled it out. They just, you know, for, for a first and second year student, oh, this, is, this must be what everyone always used because this is what we use. And no one, no one said it was this brand new thing. Um, so I, I don't think there was really an awareness there amongst the students of, of that. Maybe more if I'd been slightly older then and kind of had seen life without our life with our, I would have had that contrast. So you mentioned our sponsors, Revolution Art, who are playing for our drinks. So yes. my question is, have you used Revolution Art? What do you think? Uh, you will notice, well you won't now because my slides are going away, but I did have Revolution Art. Um, for those of you that are in academia, they do have a free academic version. Um, they are paying for the drinks tonight. Have we got this a rent from them here? Um, no? I, I invited them. <laughs> but you sent the credit card. Um, we like them even more now. <laughs> um, I, I have installed it, I have used it. I haven't used it from the point of view of doing really strong comparisons. I haven't, I haven't gone and got something that I know our struggles with and tried it in Revolution R to see is there a difference. Um, I've really just installed it and then been doing things that I always do with R. Uh, it behaves the same. I haven't noticed it uh, falling over or doing anything bad. Um, I haven't really done anything with it where I would necessarily expect there to be a big difference. So, so yeah, I. I don't have anything bad to say, but I haven't been looking for something bad to say. So I mean, I've been still good, it's fine. It's for an academic, it's still free. Uh, for a corporate user, quite how bigger advantage you get, I don't know. Maybe if you're doing data mining and really big data set stuff, you get more out of it. Um, yeah, it's not something I'll try to do. Yeah. Cheers, mate. <laughs> um, do you notice um, within the art community, and I haven't looked, so it might be a silly question, but are there uh, different communities between the analyst end users and those who are concerned with developing the internals of art? Um, are they distinct or the same people, or is it just a, a handful? Yeah, I think it's a handful. Um, 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 I think it's
I, of I, core I, users. I, I, wouldn't, I mean, I can, I can see some nodding next here. I don't, is it nodding because you agree? Or yeah. nodding is an <coughs> interesting question. Oh, I'm nodding because an interesting question. I don't know. Um, I guess I'm probably one of those members of the community that <coughs> goes there when I want something and don't really, you know, one of those awful, whatever the opposite, opposite of altruistic is. Um, I don't know, I, yeah, I, I don't know, I mean, I would suspect so, but I haven't really looked at the community enough because, I think because I've used it for so long, it's not often that I really go seeking help for it, and people that are seeking help from me for our stuff tends to be people who are on campus, or people that already know me, so they're coming to me directly, they're not going via discussion board or yeah. anything like that. So I would say probably, but I don't know. I think now that, now that R is moving into business, you've got a lot of users, end users, analysts that aren't necessarily looking under the hood and yeah. developing code because they don't have time yeah. to get something working. So maybe a distinction from that, from that, from that dimension. So imagine academics, you know, if you're using it, then it's not going to do the good thing for you, you, you'll go and play with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. I, my, my first step would always, in fact, probably even now, I mean, if there wasn't you know, something I wasn't sure about, I could go to a uh, discussion group, but I could easily just put a Facebook status post and it's some of the same people that are going to answer, um, but maybe more quickly if you're on Facebook. Or something like that. Which is really awful to say. It's, <laughs> especially I gripe about my students using Facebook. Instead of the proper place for help. But, um, <laughs> yeah. um, what's the coolest thing you've seen done with R? The coolest thing I've seen <laughs> done with R. Uh, I don't know. That's all right. Control the robot or anything? Yeah, yeah. What does um, it do your time to say? <laughs> you would have picked some cool stuff. Sorry? The New York Times article. Would have picked some cool stuff. Well, no, I think they were, they, they were like, yeah, financial data, time series. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I, I liked what Carl was doing with uh, mapping AFL players on the on, on the field and kind of amount of time at different spots on the field and how that varied game to game and win to loss. But but I like AFL, so um, so I think it's it's a little bit a little bit dependent on what you're into. I mean, I've, I've done consulting on um, kind of helping other people with our code with everything from um, electroencephalograph, so the uh, kind of the nodes measuring people's brain patterns on your head, through to pollution from concrete uh, manufacture, through to sharp go nodes. And you know, each of those three groups of people probably thought that was something pretty cool. Um, other people, maybe not so much. So. I think a lot of it is the context because the more interesting thing is, is the context that you, you bring into it. So, some recent work done on Twitter. Is that right? Twitter. Uh, yeah. Expecting you know, uh, key, Twitter, but. Key terms from Twitter. Yeah. 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 yeah um, I mean, there's sometimes. Sometimes the cool stuff is just, it's the data, it's not, I mean, it's kind of the tool to, to find out about the data. I'm sure in a couple of hours I'll think of something and think, oh, wish I'd told him about this, this was something really cool. I'll be here, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you showed Tina. I did show Tina. Um, why, don't, why aren't you using our studio? Because <laughs> it's an hour and it works fine. <laughs> <laughs> because the, even if it's not broken, you can fix it. <laughs> oh, you can. I mean, the, the, there's kind of limitations on time and playing the new software and things. <laughs> what does our studio offer? It's, it's, it's an ideal environment, so as well as um, the ability to write scripts, have the syntax highlighting and send them to R, it will show you what object you've got. Um, it'll give you access to your packages, see what packages you've got, you can easily upgrade them. You can look at your history, you can get help, it's all in one, one environment. Is it free? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. very, very small learning how this works and it's yeah. clear what's what. Yeah. Definitely.
could be one of the next years. Mm. <laughs> I do. Could that be what I haven't seen the enterprise version of Revolution, but is that the kind of paradigm they're going towards? That IDE mm. kind of. I think we're looking for ways of making. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, maybe just last one. Um, what's your, in your experience, um, have you had to deal with big data um, using R and what's your point of view on uh, how, how, how R handles big data and if there's any improvements? Tra the traditionally, using R uh, for big data has been the my PhD supervisor was um, doing something with some very, very, very big data. Um, just trying to think quite which it was. It was kind of related related to telecommunications, and beyond that, there's kind of some privacy things that I kind of kind of give you more details. Uh, he, I think, he resorted to actually um, having to have kind of some Fortran line by line stuff embedded <coughs> within R. So it was kind of getting R to then shoot out and talk to other things to try and deal with it because uh, it wasn't going so well. Um, my experience, uh, part of my PhD, was simulating uh, marriage matching, so people, people partnering up. Uh, I had really big census data sets. They came in SAS format, so I did half of my stats in SAS just because it was already in SAS format, uh, but for some log linear modeling, brought it across, it was fine for that. Uh, when I was trying to do grid-based simulation, which had a large amount of sorting really big data sets, I found that R was just too slow and so I was tending to use Java instead. But I wasn't trying to do anything too statistical, so I wasn't really losing much by moving away from R. Um, so I think it is, some of the big data and memory management stuff is, is kind of the, the difficulty and I think where, where SAS still has so, so essentially your strategy is to, to, if you can do it in other places, do it in other places and just use R as your key statistical... Um, no, I would, I'd probably say the reverse. I'd probably say I try everything in R and then if I get angry with it, then I move to, move to the alternative. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends. I mean, if, if your regular work scenario is huge data sets that you know I can't handle, then, then you kind of have to work that other way with, OK, I'm going to use SAS or I'm going to get to use whatever other tool to deal with the fact that this big data set that we're not going to do this, 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 this. But for me, I don't do all that much with the huge data outside of kind of census work, but it's New Zealand census, so I guess that's kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like working with Melbourne data. <laughs> so it hasn't been too big an issue. Cool. Okay. Yep. Your interaction with engineers and Matt Lowe, have you yes. had much uh, sort of trying to educate them around R? Uh, no, I I quite like MATLAB as well, and can kind of appreciate why for an engineer MATLAB is generally actually pretty pretty good. Um, so I think if I had an engineer approach me who was trying to use MATLAB for stats, then that would be where I'd say, well, actually, there's this other program which is going to do a much better job. Um, I think for a lot of engineering functions. That does a good job and then a lot of matrix stuff does a far better job. You know? So it depends what they're doing. I haven't really had that, that situation. Any questions? Okay, let's uh, thank Andrew for uh, interesting the job. We're going to ask my question one more time. Does anyone have any feedback in general?